you'd open to that please, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and a few weeks ago I asked uh, some people to raise their hands if they had not yet had a chance to lead the music during the Sunday night service. Now this is only for the male degree students. And forget, I saw the hands and I did make a couple mental notes and then I had two or three other conversations and I, that list went from my head. So if you don't mind, just after class tonight, if you have not yet had that chance, it doesn't matter if you're first, second, third, fourth year student, uh, come let me know if you haven't had a chance already this, uh, in, the, in the process of this school year, this year. If you haven't done that, uh, if you haven't led the music, let me know. We'll get you a time. All right, Philippians chapter 1, and uh, just a moment, we'll give you some introduction material, but let's go ahead and bow our heads and just ask God to help us with this hour. Father, as always, we just want to acknowledge uh, that we need you and that we want you. Uh, Lord, we want to hear from you. Please teach us. Father, take these words that the Spirit of God breathed into, and, and Lord, they are alive. I pray that they would quicken us tonight and stir our souls. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Philippians, one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's kind of hard, you know, that's a subjective thing to say. I get that question frequently. As a visiting preacher in another church, sometimes you'll have people coming up and asking you to sign their Bibles or uh, just different stuff, you know, and they'll say, what's your favorite verse? Now, I do have a life verse. I do have a favorite verse. Luke 24, 8 is my life verse, if you want to call it that. But then they'll say, what's your favorite book? It, it kind of depends on what I'm going through, right? Depends on where I'm at in life. And, uh, you know, Old New Testament, sometimes I don't, that can make a difference as well. But I think the book of Philippians, if I had to just, for the last 28 years of being saved, I think I've, I keep coming back to this book uh, for so many reasons. Maybe it's because of this. I think it's one of the simpler books in the New Testament. Now, no, it's no less powerful. Please don't get me wrong. When I say simple, I'm not, that's not a knock against it. The, the, the understanding of the book is, I think, pretty apparent. It doesn't need a lot of deep explanation or, or research. It needs a lot of application. The theme of the book is, is joy, if you wanted to put it in a short word. But I, I've written here, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Paul is going to hammer that theme throughout this, this book. And what's so fantastic about that is this is a prison epistle. He's writing this from a prison cell, and yet it's joy, 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 joy throughout the book. And the things that he's going to mention, I, I don't have verses here because Paul will kind of mix all of this together. Uh, the, the things that he's rejoicing in, he mentions it frequently, kind of rotating it through the book. So he's rejoicing in the saints. He rejoices in, in service, that is his opportunity to serve, and the service of others uh, to him and, and to just service in the gospel. Uh, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Savior, and the supply of all things. Um, as we go through the book, I've written here as well, written around 62 to 63. That's the time that Paul was in prison, so that's why we give it that date. As we go, you'll see some unique things about uh, the book of uh, Philippians. It has perhaps the very first Christian hymn ever is in chapter 2. Also, uniquely enough, the word supply, the only time it is found in this form. Now, you'll find it in different forms, like supply if and stuff. It'll have it in the verb form. But supply, the, the word, now you'll find it one time in 2 Corinthians 8. It's in italics, right? But the word supply is only in the book of Philippians. Chapter 1, I think 2, and then chapter 4. Uh, so as we come to that, we'll, we'll talk about that and how, why that might be interesting or unique. But um, it's also a nice three-point outline for some of you guys if you're searching for a good sermon to put together, just three different things that God supplies. All right, so we're going to dive right in here. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul and Timotheus. Right, right away, you might notice something different about that. All the other epistles that we've looked at so far, if you just flip back to Ephesians 1, it, it was Paul, right? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And uh, in Galatians 1 and 1, Paul, an apostle. It's just him alone. And now it's Paul and Timotheus. You know, whenever you're going through a tough time, Paul's in prison, it's good to have a brother there with you. It's good to have somebody to help. And, and never be too strong. Ne never get this... this tinge of pride that says, I, I, I don't need help. I'll get through this alone. We're not built like that. 
bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You need to do it for others, and sometimes you need to let them do it for you. So praise God for Timothy's. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Philippi was one of the main cities in Macedonia. You'll read about this in Acts chapter 16. That's the first time that Paul uh, went there. You might remember the Macedonian vision. It's how we usually refer to it, that man of Macedonia that Paul saw in a vision saying, come over here and help us. And then he went to Philippi, which was the chief city in that area. Now, notice who he's writing to, all the saints that are at Philippi. And they also says, with the bishops and deacons. Right? This is, it's typical for Paul to write to all the saints, but now he, he discloses the two offices of the church. Now, we're not going to spend much time talking about this. I'll just bring it to your attention. But throughout the history of the church, we're talking 2,000 years, there has been discussion about how many offices there should be in the church. Uh, should we have bishops and deacons? Is that it? Or... Should we have pastors, bishops, deacons? Should we have overseers, pastors, bishops, deacons? What happens is a lot of times they'll take the word overseer, they'll take the word bishop, they'll take the word uh, pastor, and they will separate those into different things. The word elder, as best I can tell, those words are all synonymous. Now, like I said, that's perhaps a Bible study for another time. That's not, we're not trying to focus on that tonight. Because Paul mentioned it the way he did, if a local church was meant to have four offices or three or whatever, it seems that Paul would have made note of that here. The fact that he breaks it into two categories, this helps me to see there's two offices in the church, bishop, deacon. Now, you can give the bishops different names, pastors, overseers, elders, etc., but they're going to perform the same function. All right, so verse number two, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've talked about this very general open opening. Uh, Paul says this in all of his epistles. But if I might make a practical note here, Paul's in prison. His life has taken a turn for the worse, as far as, you know, a man would consider it. This isn't nice to be stuck in a prison. And yet, there are some things that you're going to find stability in. The grace and peace that comes from God our Father, that doesn't change no matter where you sleep. In prison or comfortably in your own bed, you still need grace and peace. So try to remember what keeps you stable. In verse number three, it says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. All right, now think about this for a moment. You are a member of the church in Philippi. Just imagine this, hypothetically. And your pastor gets into the pulpit that Sunday morning. He says, guys, I got a letter from somebody special. Just wanted to read it to you. This is the founder of our church. And, and he's in prison. Guys, we need to pray for him. He's going through a really rough time. They're talking about putting him to death. This is really serious. And he says, Paul and Timothy and greets him. And here he says, I thank God for you folks. Every time I remember you, I'm always praying for you. And I'm doing it with joy. Imagine hearing that from Paul in his circumstance right now, that me just being a faithful church member at Philippi is helping Paul go through something very difficult. And I am rejoicing his heart simply because I'm still here and I haven't quit yet. Imagine that. Imagine how, imagine how much encouragement it would be for you as that Philippian church member to hear that the Apostle Paul is praying for you. I mean, wouldn't it be something, right? If, if Paul were, I, again, hypothetically, if you got a letter from the Apostle Paul tonight that said, hey, brother, sister, love you, praying for you, well, I'd, I'd go home pretty stoked. Eh? I, I'd go home pretty excited and encouraged, and man, I can, I can keep going. Whatever I'm dealing with, I can keep going. Okay, I'll give you one better than that. The Bible says Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for you. So although Paul cannot write you a letter and deliver it to you, Jesus can, and he did, and he wants to remind you that even right now tonight while you're sitting in class, he says, you know, I am so thankful to see you still with it. You haven't given up. You're still growing. You're still, praise God, you rejoice my heart. 
and I'm praying for you. So maybe just a, a question, more of a preaching nature than teaching, but when people remember you, does it bring joy or grief? In verse 3, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. He says, I make requests with joy. When Paul thought on these people, it brought joy to his heart. When, when you come to somebody's mind, is it a, man, praise God for that, that person? Or is it a, oh, God, have mercy on them. <laughs> oh, God, help me, help them. Are you high maintenance or low? I mean, we could go on and on with that, but not everybody brings that same joy. You, you tr try to be the kind of person that brings joy, right? Do, do just perhaps, I don't know if you want to make the note, but Hebrews 13, verse 17, it talks about there, obey them that have the rule over you. It, it says, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, that they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for it, that is unprofitable for you. So in, in talking about that relationship, church member to church leader, it, you ought, your pastor ought to be able to look over you, right, with, with joy and, and, and realize, hey, th this person's really trying. Thank God for them. Now, Philippians 1 and verse 5, Paul tells us a little bit more about where this joy is coming from. In verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What joy is rejoicing Paul's heart so much? He's thinking back the first day that he met these people. Right now, of course, he started the church. He saw new people coming in, getting saved. He thinks back to those early days, a bunch of new Christians sitting there while he's teaching and preaching. Can you imagine being discipled by the Apostle Paul? I mean, this is just a different level of awesome. And, and he remembers looking out over their faces, and they're hungrily looking at him going, oh, yeah, yeah, well, I've never heard this. Man, that makes sense. Paul, what about this? And then Paul's giving answers going, wow. And, you know, they're making notes and just, Paul thinks back to that. He says, I remember that first, from the first day until now, we have enjoyed fellowship in the gospel. Fellowship in the gospel, which tells me something. Within the church, I love getting to have good fellowship of any nature, right? But we cannot be in a church and have proper godly fellowship if it's not centered around the gospel. The fellowship is in the gospel. That entire church was fired up about one thing, at, at least one thing, and that is Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. People can get saved and their lives can be transformed. We have something worth living for and worth dying for, and it was all about the gospel. It was about what the gospel had done for them and now their, can we say, excitement to get the gospel out to someone else. That was the fellowship that Paul was thinking back on and was so special. In verse number six, Paul goes on to say, being confident of this very thing. So he looks back to this wonderful past with them and how fired up they are about the gospel. And he says, I'm confident that the same God that you were excited about back then, he's going to keep working in you. And, and you don't have to backslide. You don't have to grow cold in your walk and your relationship with God. Being confident, not that you guys are so great and smart and strong that you'll never quit because of you, but, but God's never going to stop working in you. So Paul's thinking back at the, as to how they started to grow and now what is Paul's confidence that they will continue to grow? we got a really big God that lives inside of us. And he has promised that he won't quit even when we do. He abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. This, this verse gives us a great opportunity. This is a great verse, I think, to, to, that speaks to eternal security. The reason we are once saved and then always saved it is not because of us. It's not because of our good works towards God. It is because of God's good work in us. We are saved forever because he promised. Our salvation is as secure and as sure as the promises of God. If our salvation was only as secure as our labor and as our good works, then none of us would go home with any sense of confidence or assurance about eternity. We'd always be wondering, am I going to live it tomorrow? 
right? Which has to make you think, why are there then verses in the Bible where Peter and Paul and James, these other apostles said, I know what's coming in my future. They weren't saying that because they were great men living great lives. They were saying that because they knew the promises of God. What did John say? This is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. Our eternal life is based on his promise. It's a gift. You didn't earn it. It's based on grace. It's based on that promise. All right, so verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. All right, be careful that at the end there. Not till the day you die. The work of God goes beyond that. What do we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16? It says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Just because you're dead, that, that doesn't get you out of Christ. Paul said what in Romans 8? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The first thing in the list was death. Not even death can separate us from Christ. So this good work that Paul is referring to here is not complete until we are resurrected with a glorified body in the perfect image of Christ. And we are confident of this very thing. And this is one reason, one among many, one reason that Christians don't fear death like the rest of the world. Because we know that's not the end of things. We're going to see later in the chapter Paul's attitude towards that. In verse number 7, Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. All right, so let's work through this just bit by bit here. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all. So Paul is saying it, it's fitting for me to have this kind of joy and confidence in you. Why? He's saying, I know you guys can make it. I, I know you guys can continue to grow, etc. Why? Because the same grace that Paul experienced during his trials and persecutions, right? He's in prison. The grace that God is giving him, it's the same God that can give them grace and get them through anything they're going to face. So that's why it's, it's, it's fitting, it's meet for Paul to think this about them. One thing is, he says, I have you in my heart. Well, he has this inward affection towards them. So yes, when you have an inward affection, you want to give that person the benefit of the doubt. You want to think the best about them. But the reason he's thinking so highly of them is because he knows they have God working in them. And then he says, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. He, he's recognizing that the same strength that God's given him, they're going to have whenever it's time for them to defend the gospel and confirm the gospel. So verse number eight, he says, for God is my record how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Uh, if I could sum this verse up, I'd say it like this. Sometimes we cannot explain in, in words just how deeply we feel about other people. Right now, this is, I think this is true. Many of you know this. If it's your spouse, if it's your children, perhaps a mom or a dad, something like that. But, but here, brothers and sisters in Christ, Paul is calling on God as his witness. God is my record. So, guys, he's saying, I, I love you more than I could possibly say, and the only one that can really verify just how deeply affected I am because of you, in a good way, is God. I, I've, I've found that that's a, a very fitting statement. The longer I'm in the ministry, I would like to show my appreciation to people. And, and I, I think sometimes, okay, what can I do? I mean, chocolate, that works. But somebody can only handle so much chocolate. You know, you can buy them gifts. You can, you can, you can shake their hand, give them a hug. I, bro I love you, brother. Appreciate you. But I, to be honest, I'm now several years in. I have yet to find just the right words to express my deep appreciation for my brothers and sisters in Christ. So I understand what Paul's getting at here, that sentiment. Now, 
I must admit, though, in modern-day English, I would not word my appreciation the way he did here. I would not be talking about the bowels of Jesus Christ. That just, to our ears, that's a little strange, right? We go, um, that sounds like an IBS problem almost. And I think some people do give the Lord IBS, but that's... <laughs> When he says, I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ, where are they spiritually? They are in Christ. Right? The bowels, the way that that word is used in the Bible, it's not your intestines just, you know, uh, uh, necessarily. It's just the inward parts. This is a word that was used to refer to the inward affection, the deepest part of your heart. Right? So that's how we would word it. From, from, the, from the bottom of my heart, that is what we might say today. Right? I see some of you going, yeah, that sounds a whole lot better. But <laughs> we're in Christ, but now Paul is saying in, from the deepest part of being in Christ. Does that make sense? So from, if we're in Christ, good. Now in the heart of Christ, in the deepest, from the bottom of that part. He's saying that's how much I, I care about you guys. So his affection for them comes from their position in Christ. Does that make sense? It's not because... They were rich, famous people that bought him a lot of gifts when he was there. It's not because he owed them a favor. It was because they're in Christ and they had that fellowship around the gospel. Now, verse number nine, he says, and this I pray. All right, so now and back in verse five, uh, I'm sorry, four, he told us that he's praying for him. And, and then he acknowledges God's going to keep working and, and God, the same grace Paul's getting, God's going to give to them. And now he's going to tell us more about what he's praying for. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. All right. Now, the verse doesn't stop there. He says, I want you guys to learn more and more about love, but not just any old love, not just, you know, the world's version or the secular version of love, but love in a specific manner that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. All right. So this is a. Uh, a love that leads you to learn more so that you can make better decisions. So this is a love for the truth, a love for God, a love for lost souls, loving things that God would want you to love. He says, I want you guys to grow in that and abound in that more and more. All right, so the things that you spend your time learning. Right, the, the Bible talks in the book of Proverbs about a foolish man. He feeds on foolishness. Right? Be careful what you feed your mind. Right? If, if you feed junk into the mind, that's what, I mean, nobody's going to be able to run well on junk food. You just feed yourself junk food. You go for a little while, but eventually your body's going to give out. You got to put some healthy stuff in there. And, and if you're trying to grow, be careful what you're feeding your mind, what you're feeding your heart. Try to learn things that will help you make good decisions, uh, it, well, in life, but especially in spiritual matters. Right. Read the right books. Listen to the right sermons. Ask the right questions. Do you see how those two things go together? You want to grow more in knowledge and in all judgment. So knowledge, knowing the facts so that I can make better decisions. I can judge between right and wrong. Now, we might say wisdom is, is part of that as well. All right, now he goes on. The, the sentence just is getting started here. So he's praying the love would grow and that it would lead them to learn more. Verse 10, that you may approve things that are excellent. Now, that's the reason for the judgment. That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Now, we saw that already in verse number 6. The day of Jesus Christ. This is the short version, the day of Christ. And this is always going to point to the rapture every time. The day of Christ involves three things, actually. All right, so here we have... The cross and then approximately 2,000 years, right? The day of Christ starts with the rapture and then it, I'm going to put D-O-C, day of Christ, and then it continues up here with the judgment seat of Christ and then also over here with the marriage of the Lamb. Let's make that a big C. All right, now once this is done, the day of Christ starts here with the rapture, judgment seat, marriage of the Lamb. Then when we're done with the wedding, our honeymoon is that we fight the battle of Armageddon, which <laughs> there's a lot of deep preaching in that, right? Because after you get married, it's a, it's a battle. <laughs> but in any event, down we come, down we come. 
And, and this now starts something different. It's the day of the Lord. The second coming, all the way to the end of the millennium, this is the day of the Lord. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse, what is it, 8, one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. You'll find this phrase in the book of Isaiah, I think it's either 91, I think it's 92 times in the book of Isaiah, the phrase, the day of the Lord is used. And, and every time it's going to be pointing to this event, the second coming, or this event, the kingdom age, that, that thousand year period there. All right, so Paul, he's referring here to the day of Christ. He's praying for them. For what? That they continue to grow. In, in what? In love. Love for what? Truth. But why? To make good decisions. And, and, and what's the big, the, the, the overall goal here? That they may be sincere and without offense. So that they, they're going about a purposeful Christian life. Please listen to that. A purposeful Christian life. You have to mean to do it. That's what he's praying for. Though. God, don't. Here's what happens. You get involved in a good church. And, and this, this is a good thing. But you, you fall in with the momentum of that church. And here you got a bunch of people that are excited about God and the Bible, and you fall in with that, and you're now in, you know, moving with that flow. And that's a good flow to be in. But the danger to that is you're just going with their flow. And you're not doing it sincerely. You're going through good motions, but you lose the heart. That's one of the dangers of being in a good church. Right? Now, if you're in a bad church, you have to fight again. I mean, there's bad things happening. You've got to go against that flow. But in a good church, you have to watch out for this and, and stay sincere and without offense. Lord, help me to keep making good decisions all the way to the day of Christ. In verse 11, it goes on. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. All right Now, by doing what he's just mentioned in verses 9 and 10, growing in love, making good decisions, being sincere, then you are going to be filled with the fruits of righteousness, various outcomes. And we've met this a few times. Galatians, you know, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all of that. In Ephesians 5, we studied it a couple weeks ago. In Ephesians 5 and 9, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So by this consistent pursuit of growth and sincerity, then the outcome is going to be all of those proper virtues in your life. And then he says, which are by Jesus Christ. This is to say he's the source of all those good things. It's not you just figuring out how to be a good person and doing it, but, but you're doing it in obedience to him and letting him give you instruction. And then what's the end goal? Unto the glory and praise of God. So one day you stand there at the judgment seat of Christ. Your work is examined. And he says, here's a guy, here's a, here's a lady that lived in submission to God, this is what God wanted. And in the end, that person would stand there and say, I made it here and I'm in this condition because I listened to him. I did it his way. Praise the Lord for that. So this is a, man, Paul is a, he's such a great author. The Holy Spirit leading him in such a wonderful way to summarize what is expected of a Christian. Their entire life's growth, right there in verse 9, 10, 11. I mean, front, front to back, it's all right there. All right, verse number 12, but I would have, uh, it says, but I would, ye should understand, brethren. All right, so a little bit of a pivot here. I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. All right, so he's telling them, guys, I, I know you've heard about me being in prison. I'm being persecuted. Don't think that my suffering is useless. Don't think that the gospel has now taken a step back because I've been persecuted like this. His trials are not hindering the gospel. They're actually furthering the gospel. And then he tells us in what way, verse 13, that so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So now even people in the palace, they're the big shots at Rome are talking about the gospel. You realize without him being in prison, that may not have happened. There are some people now hearing the gospel in places that he may not have been able to reach had this not happened, which is a great practical lesson. When you're going through something tough, 
Maybe look for the bright side of that. How is God using this particular trial to get the gospel somewhere that it wouldn't have reached otherwise? In verse number 14, he says, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. All right? Paul's in prison. And now a bunch of Roman soldiers are passing by his, his prison every day and talking to him, taking him food. You know what Paul's doing, right, while he's in prison? He's winning people to Christ. Now, we know this because that's what the book of Philemon is. It's Paul saying, I got this guy that was next to me, sitting next to me in prison, Onesimus. He was a runaway slave. He got caught doing something, stole from his master, and I led him to Christ. And now he's writing a letter back to the person he stole from saying, take him back. He's saved now. He'll, he'll do well by you. Paul was in prison winning souls to Christ. So here these soldiers are walking by, and Paul says, hey, you know what? I'm in the army too. They go, really? Yeah, I'm in the Lord's army. What kind of armor you got there? What, what, what kind of piece are you packing? Oh, that's a nice sword. That's sharp. Mine's sharper. <laughs> I mean, constantly talking about the Lord. You know what those soldiers do when they go home? They go, honey, you'll never, you'll never believe this, this weirdo I met in prison today. Oh, this guy was weird. Talking about how he's a, one of the generals in the army and he's got a sharp sword and the guy had nothing. It was kind of weird. I mean, just, but I tell you what, he's telling me about Jesus. And I, Have you heard about this guy's Jesus? Have you heard that name? And the wife said, you know, I, yeah, I have. I, down there at the salon where I'd get my hair done, you know. <laughs> yeah, they, we were talking about this guy, some, some Jewish guy, some prophet or something. And word starts to travel Right? And now other people are, are hearing about this. And then people in churches, have, they say, hey, uh, let's pray for Paul. He's in prison. Somebody says, yeah, you know what? Here's a couple guards in the church. They got saved because Paul led them to Christ. They're in the church. They go, man, now if Paul is able to win souls to Christ from a prison cell, what excuse do we have for not winning souls to Christ with our freedom? So now those brethren are getting bold verse 14, much more bold to speak the word without fear because they know even if we do get arrested and thrown in prison, God can still use us. That's not the end of us. God is still very real to Paul. Paul is filled with joy and they're saying, well, if God's going to be that great, regardless of where you're at, well, let's just go preach to somebody. And everybody's getting fired up as a result of it. Now, verse 15, he acknowledges another Consequence here, some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. All right, I think a couple of things perhaps was going on here. There were some brethren, Paul was thrown into prison, and I say this, I'm going to throw this out as a possibility because it still happens today. Right? Somebody's preaching, they have a ministry, and then something goes wrong. Somebody's phone keeps going off. You might want to check that, just whoever you are. But, but you know, we're going along in the ministry, and then there's some sort of hiccup. You know what some other pastor will do? Yeah, you know what? If he would do this different and that different, he wouldn't find those problems. And, and that probably happened back there as well. You know, if Paul would just be a little calmer, you know, he was so rude. Paul would just be so sharp with people. You know, he didn't have to talk about how the cross is offensive. And, man, he didn't have to talk about how Judaizers this. And that. You know, if Paul would just ease up a bit. And then they would say, Paul, stand it. Let me show you how to do it. All right, now listen. Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. That's true. But, and they're, they're putting the same information out there, but they think they're going to word it in such a way so that they can avoid making enemies. Now, they didn't have good intentions. They were trying to just prove that they could do it better, right? Strife, uh, uh, envy, All right? Now, some also, it says contention, verse 16. The one preached Christ to contention. So it could be that some people were trying to prove that they could preach better than Paul and somehow their good preaching would help them avoid persecution, right? Maybe some of that goes into it. But the other thing might be this, that people hear this and they... they they don't like the message. They don't agree with the message. But what do they do? You know how this goes. When you hear something you don't agree with, you go find some. hey, did you hear? And then you explain the whole message. You explain the other person's position, 
And then you try to rail on it, but you just told them the whole message. <laughs> right? You just put it all out there. I, I remember a while back there was a Catholic priest that got up and did that. And some, I can't remember where it was, but he got up in his church and said, now these Baptist preachers, they're saying this and this and this. And he presented the gospel spot on. <laughs> and I thought, thank you. I never could have stood in a Catholic pulpit. They call it a lectern there. I never could have stood there and given the gospel, but you just did. <laughs> So now your congregation has heard, thank you for that. Now, of course, he had a, a different motive. So I think either way, it, it could be one or the other or both things were going on. All right, so he says in verse 16, if you could look there again, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So now he's speaking to their motive. They think that by going around town saying, hey, everybody, listen to what Paul's preaching. Paul is saying this and this and this. And, and Paul says that our gods aren't any good. Paul's saying that our religion isn't any good. They think by stirring up the, the public against Paul, it will make it tougher for Paul in prison. And Paul says, okay, I, you, you might think that it's going to get tougher for me, but at the same time, you're telling everybody what I've been saying. You're passing along the message, so thank you for the help the whole time. Verse 17, he says, but the other of love. Right, so verse 15, there's goodwill and then love. You've got this crowd that they are also continuing to preach the gospel. And they know that by preaching the gospel, yes, it might stir up some agitation against Paul. The public still might think, yep, Paul's the bad guy. But they, they know if things get more difficult for Paul, Paul is ready to take that. That this isn't going to scare Paul away. So even if things get a bit tough, we know Paul's heart in this. Paul would still want us to keep preaching the gospel. He is set for the defense of it. All right, verse 18. What then? Notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense, pretense is like they're faking it. Uh, it it's a lie. Whether in pretense or in truth. So they're, they're preaching. It, it sounds like they mean something good, but really they have bad motives, envy. Or... They're preaching and they genuinely want to see people saved. Either way, Paul says, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Here's the theme. Rejoice, and again I say, rejo I rejoice and I'm going to continue to rejoice. Why? Paul says, this isn't about me. This is about Christ getting preached so that other people can know him personally. And if that means i got to suffer a little bit, then so be it. Verse 19 for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. All right, now, pause just for a moment here. Make sure that when you read the word salvation, you do not link that to eternal life or you know, eternal salvation. The word salvation can be used hundreds of ways. You can be saved from all sorts of problems. The word saved simply means rescued. Or delivered. So if you're in debt, you can be rescued from that. If you're in disease, you can be rescued from that. Where's, what's Paul in? What is his danger? The danger is, while he's being persecuted, the danger is to quit. The danger is to say, enough's enough, you know, tap out, I'm done, I can't take it anymore. And for Paul, that would be the absolute worst outcome. So he says, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. So I know that everything the enemy is trying to do to make it more difficult, I know that in the end, all of this is going to turn out okay because you guys are praying for me. And I know that the Lord will continue to supply the spirit of Jesus Christ. I, I, I know that he's not going to leave me alone. In verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be what? Ashamed. That's what he was afraid of would happen right uh, let's say that was the danger he didn't want to be ashamed by quitting on the Lord he says that in nothing I should be ashamed but that with all boldness as always so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether it be by life or by death all right so what is Paul's ultimate goal it's not his own comfort it's God's glory and if God can get glory because Paul continues to live and preach the gospel, good. But if God would get glory because he dies a martyr's death, well, that also accomplishes the purpose. 
Now, as a human being, right, if we have to choose between comfort or persecution, please don't feel bad that you would choose comfort. Paul would choose comfort, right? Any sane person, how do we know this? Look at Ephesians 5, verse 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Right? We're not, we don't look at the body with this sadistic mindset to go, okay, I want pain. You know, come on, devil, throw all the fiery dart. We didn't, come on. We're, that, that, that's, a, that's, a stra- that's a cultish kind of attitude to say we want bad things. That's not it. But Paul's aware that it might happen. But the end goal is Christ be magnified. Life or death. So either way, Paul's going to win, and he's confident These people praying for him, God's promise of the Spirit, the supply of that, he's going to make it. He's not going to quit. Now, back to Philippians 1 and verse 21, a very famous verse. I'm sure you have it memorized. If you don't, tonight's the night to stick that in your heart. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Two words you should notice in there. For... To me, I've heard people quote this, but they leave that out. They'll say, to live, it's, to live is Christ, to die is gain. They just start it there. To live is Christ, to die is gain. That, that's okay. I appreciate the sentiment, but let's be sure we quote that right. To me, for to me, to live is Christ. Not everybody in the world would say that. But that's a decision you have to make. To me, what is life about? To live is Christ. Everything that goes with that. And to die is gain. So, I remember years ago hearing the story. I was a young Christian when I first heard it. How many of you know the name J. Frank North? His nickname was the Texas Tornado. Back in the early 1900s, he uh, started a church in Fort Worth, Texas. That's where I grew up. Now, of course, not the same era, same generation. But uh, the Texas Tornado, that guy, whew, he was rough. He had a, a large church there in, in Fort Worth, and he had a deacon that got sideways with him. And this deacon, I mean, he was hot. He, he was angry at Brother Norris. So he, he sent a message. He said, Preacher, I'm, I'm, I'm out for you. Either you resign the church, or I'm going to come in there and make you resign. And the guy was threatening to kill him. The deacon was. So the deacon stormed across the street and banged on his door and let himself in, and Brother Norris... I mean, there's that deacon standing there. I think it was a pistol they had in his hand or something like that. But threatening his life, he said, he said, listen here, brother, you can't scare me with heaven. <laughs> the rest of that story is not so great. But Brother Norris took out a pistol and <laughs> sent him to heaven. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I don't agree with how he handled that, but <laughs> it was one of those times it was him or me, right? <laughs> So we'll see now. I mean, Paul had a decision to depart or to stick around and minister a little longer. Brother Norris decided to stick around a little longer. Now, guys, it was self-defense. I'm telling you the whole story, but let's just take from that story one one little nugget. (laughs) Pistol aside, you can't scare me with heaven. right? And that's the point. Verse 21, as long as I'm alive, my life is Christ. That's what life is. And to die, when I die, it's just going to get better from there. And that's, man, you think about that? As, as, a, as a Christian, this is as bad as your life will ever be. This is it. Your worst day as a Christian is better than your best day as a lost man. As a Christian, this is as close as you'll ever get to hell. This is it. You won't get any close. This is it. I don't mean like South Africa. I mean this earth. <laughs> this is as close as you'll ever get to hell. I just wanted to clarify, <laughs> right? <laughs> but if you're lost, listen, if you're, if you're in this room even tonight, you're not born again, this is as close as you'll ever get to heaven. This is as good as it will ever be for you. Mm. Verse 22, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. I, I don't know. That's just old English for I don't know. Uh, So he says, if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. So if I'm going to stick around and continue to live, then I'm going to continue to preach. And if I'm going to continue to preach, I'm going to continue to feel persecution. This is the fruit of my labor. People are not going to like what I'm saying, and some people are going to be against me and try to add to my bond. So as long as I'm alive, I need to expect resistance. And he says, now, I still have a choice. 
I'm not sure what I'm going to choose. Verse 23. For I am in a strait betwixt two. Right, just, we would say I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. I got a tough decision to make. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Now, uh, you can let your imagination do what it will, but for me, every time I read that, I stop right there. I think Paul, when he wrote it, my imagination, I think he was writing that. And he's getting along there and he's writing to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. And then he just picked the pen off the paper for a while and just sat there and thought about that. He said, man. Paul knew what to say. He could say the right thing and get departed from this life. He could do that. He knew. You just say the right thing to the right person and you're in front of Jesus just like that. I mean, but he sat there with a the pen going, that would be so sweet. Oh, that would solve so many problems. I would never be hungry again. I'd never have aches and pains again. I'd never sin again. Never hear another cuss word. I'd... Oh. And then Paul thought about that for a while and thought, all right, there was no full stop there. Let's finish. Let's finish that sentence. Verse 24, nevertheless. Now, if I'm Paul, again, in my imagination, I bet he sighed when he wrote that. <laughs> nevertheless you know, that's, that's what I would have done <laughs> nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you alright so tiebreaker how do you make this decision to depart and be with Christ that's a good decision alright but, but to stay alive that's a good decision nothing wrong with staying alive which one's better in this case well it's better for Paul personally to go be with Jesus but, but the tiebreaker here is not what's better for Paul, it's what's better for you. He was thinking about others. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So what is going to help you the most? What, what will help you the most is if I stick around and keep ministering to the best of my ability by God's grace. Verse 25, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide. So I, you see where Paul acknowledges, I have a decision, but I've already decided. I have found myself there plenty of times, even recently. God, do I, can I keep going? Do I have the strength to keep going? And what keeps me going is you guys, honestly, because I think God still has something for me to do. And if he didn't, there's lots of other things that would be better for me personally, but in the long run, I'd be miserable. I can't imagine a more, a more precious privilege than getting to stand here doing this. This is just outstanding. In verse 25, having this confidence, I know that I shall abide. So I, I'm, I'm going to stick with it as long as I can. And continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So he says, I want to stick around to help you grow so that you can rejoice in Jesus Christ because Jesus sent me to you. Right? Everybody with that? All right, because he, he moves around there quite a bit. But, but he's saying, I, I want to be a, a tool in the hand of Christ so that you can rejoice more. Now, th that's what you want to be. That's what, if you're going to get into the ministry, pray for that. God, use me as a tool to help other people realize how precious you are. Look at verse 26, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ. I want people to realize more and more just how great he is. Because the more you learn about him, the more you're going to rejoice in him. And the more you're going to say, wow, a Savior that great loves somebody like me and, and still works with me despite my faults and infirmities. So verse 27 he says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. So your conversation, this is slightly old English. Uh, this word as it's used in the Bible means how you live, your manner of life. Uh, only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. So it needs to be fitting. The gospel of Christ, here's a message of the death, burial, and resurrection that can offer somebody the eternal life and reconcile them to God. So the way you live should reflect how great that message is. So here's, this is the standard, right? This is the standard 
uh, for your, let's say, the expectations? How, how, how good should your life be? How clean? How, how zealous? What should your life look like? What are we aiming for? I want to live a life that is consistent with how great the gospel is. Right? I don't want to do anything that makes the gospel look bad. So only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent. So Paul is aware of the fact he wants to stick around and keep living so that he can go see them again. But he also knows that's not completely in his control. He may not make it back. And he may not make it back quickly. So he says, guys, whether I'm there or whether I'm not, here's what I want, that I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. He says, guys, whether I'm there or not, you need to do right for the gospel's sake. Don't do right for the pastor's sake. This is actually the same sentiment that we learned in Ephesians 6 where he talks about the servant and the master and you're not supposed to give him eye service. That same concept can apply in a church. You can have a church member who, who lives the Christian life only when the pastor is watching or only when they're at church and other church members are watching. But, but they, they're not living like that at work or at school. But see, the gospel of Christ... This is one really good reason to be a soul winner. There's many good reasons. But you go to work tomorrow. You go to school tomorrow. And I'm not saying to be obnoxious about it. Be smart, right? Be harmless as doves and wise as serpents. But, but just do this. Just carry your Bible to class. It's going to be a whole lot harder to sin when, with your Bible in your hand. Right? But put your Bible on your desk at work. It's a whole lot more difficult then to have naughty conversations over your desk with a Bible sitting right there. Get a few gospel tracts laying out. Right? All you got to do is speak up once or twice, and now people know, oh, that's the one that talks about Jesus, and it gets a whole lot more difficult than to live a, a, a sinful life. So live up to the gospel. Now, within the church, and that's who Paul's writing to, that you stand fast in one spirit. Right? So we all have one attitude, if you will, one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. So we, we have a unity... That is based on what? It is based on evangelism, actually. We, we want other people to hear about the gospel, so let's work together to get that done. And if you really think about it, you know, a lot of churches lack unity, and the body of Christ lacks unity. You know where it comes from. It's not from some people taking strong positions. That, that is actually something that would harbor unity, by taking a strong position, saying this is the truth, anybody that lines up with it, then we can experience unity. But, but what's happening is people don't even, even churches don't even know what the gospel is anymore. And then within some churches, they, the pastor will actually fight the members if they try to evangelize. I know it because I, we have people that come through this church, learn to evangelize, and then especially you students, you get... You graduate, you move off, you get a job somewhere else, you plug into a, a church somewhere else, and then people that have been around here, they know we're supposed to go out witnessing. And you know what the pastor will do? Over and over again, they, they call or they write. And they say, Pastor Mike, what do I do? My pastor won't let me hand out tracts. My pastor told me to stop doing it. My pastor won't let me bring new converts to church. And you know why? Because as soon as they start doing it, then the pastor is going to feel as if he needs to also evangelize. And he's not comfortable to do that. And there's where the disunity, there, there's where the, the disruption comes from. Verse 28, he says, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. So guys, stick together. Keep moving forward the gospel. Don't let your enemies scare you out of your position. Which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. So their adversaries were making this accusation, saying, if you guys are right, why do you have so many enemies? Now, the persecutors, the adversaries, would have a point if the end goal is to make people like you. If that was the goal of life, then yes, these Christians were failing miserably, and so are we today. But what if Jesus was right instead of these adversaries? Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you too. So 
the adversary said, you Christians have so many people against you, doesn't that mean you're wrong? No. That, listen, I, I've, I've heard this before. Some people say there's a billion people in this religion. How can it be wrong? The, the numbers of adherence to a position means nothing as to the truth of the position. There, you, you can have a billion Muslims. You can have a billion Roman Catholics. That, that says nothing. That, that just means that a billion people believe a lie. That's all that means. That, that doesn't say anything to the veracity of the message. So he says at the end here, uh, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Your persecution, that the, one, the, the, the persecution you're getting, to you this proves that you're on the right path. You're following in the footsteps of Christ. In verse 29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on His name. That was a gift. right? God graciously getting you the gospel and saying, here is your opportunity to be saved and to be in my family. That was a gift, yes. Gift of God is eternal life. That was a gift. Here's another gift. But also to suffer for His sake. He says, just, just so you know, this gift, here's another gift. It is the privilege of getting to walk the same steps that my son walked. This is the privilege. Verse 30, he explains that more. Having the same conflict which he saw in me, and now here to be in me. So Paul knows that the suffering he's going through, the Philippians are also feeling persecution. They are in the same boat, if you will. He says, you guys are having the same conflict. So, so guys, don't think that me having so many enemies somehow means that I've made a mistake. And don't think your enemies means you've made a mistake. We're right where God wants us to be. This is a gift. This is a privilege. And again, it's not that we want to hurt or, or suffer, but we understand where it's coming from. And we know that it's worth it. All right, there we go. We've reached the end of chapter 1. Any questions about what we've covered tonight? Did you guys notice as we went through the chapter just how many times he talked about joy? Did you notice that? In verse 4, there's joy. In, in, then in verse 8 and 9, he talks about how much he loves them. In verse 23, he's thinking about being with Christ. Uh, where did I see it just a moment ago? Uh, verse 26, that your rejoicing may be more abundant. He's writing all this while sitting in a prison cell, having more and more persecution heaped on him, and knowing that it's just going to get worse, and he can't qu quit talking about joy. <laughs> it's one of the paradoxes of the Christian life, but it's a real thing. Okay, any questions? Nothing? All right, guys, if you have not had a chance to uh, lead the music yet, please come find me after we're done, and we'll get you that chance. Let's go ahead and pray. Head to the house. Uh, Ruan, do you mind praying tonight and asking God to... Dismisses. Lord, I pray that you bring us back to home. Uh, Lord, I pray for us to be in the week to come. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, you guys get home safe.